No matter if points are gained or points are lost, there will be much to discuss. For analysis regarding tonight's Winnipeg Jets game, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mandel. The Illegal Curve post-game show starts now. Good evening, Winnipeg. Good evening, Manitoba. For all the jo- those joining us on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, we say good evening, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve post-game show with Dave Manuk, with Ezra Ginsberg. The gang is back together. I'm your host, Drew Mindell, here to discuss the Winnipeg Jets for the first time this season, having lost three regulation time games in a row, a game they led one nothing until late in the third period. Then they perform a full collapse as the Edmonton Oilers go on to win 3-1 tonight, a huge victory for the Edmonton Oilers, a hard defeat for the Winnipeg Jets, uh, a game that the Oilers really controlled a lot of the contest, and Connor Hellbuck but stood on his head until he didn't, and it ends up with an Oilers 3-1 victory. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Nice to be all back together again for the first time in a few games. Uh, an entertaining contest. Look, this is a fun hockey game to watch. It remind, You watch a game like tonight's, and it reminds you of all the other games that get played over the course of an 82-game season where there isn't the same level of emotion and there isn't the same level of, uh, of you know, sort of, dislike on the ice you felt an energy in the room you felt an energy in the arena you felt an energy on the ice unfortunately for the Winnipeg Jets they couldn't bring it home for the hometown fans nice to see you both yeah nice to see you boys and thanks everybody for joining us tonight yeah I mean when you have a a one goal lead that you're sitting on Mm -hmm. I was telling that to Dave as we were watching this game here in the third period like the Jets played pretty well defensively but there was no insurance goal right and, and then obviously, you know, Darnell Nurse, we'll get into it in the Betway game recap, but that was a bit of a knuckler, a bit of the old knuckle puck, as they say, right, Dave? Um, and then obviously, you know, Dreisaitl scores the, the winner on the power play. But, I mean, right from puck drop, boys, the Edmonton Oilers had, had the, the faster legs, right? Like yeah. the shots, I think it was 5 nothing to start the game in the first couple minutes, right, Dave? You were in the building and, uh, you know, Zach Hyman had a really good chance off of rebound from the Evan Bouchard shot. Uh, Connor Brown I made a note of that he had a good scoring chance in that first period Um, obviously you know later in the game I think that was the second period right boys Matthias Janmark had the the breakaway shorthanded Uh, so I mean that was a a big save by Hellebuck and and look Hellebuck was perfect up until that Darnell Nurse knuckler right and it's kind of funny right I was thinking like everybody who watches the show regularly knows I'm a big Devils fan and sometimes Marty Brodeur would do that right like Marty Mm -hmm. Brodeur the most NHL wins of all time and sometimes he would let in goals like that. And, you know, I, I said to Dave Drew, you know, I wasn't sure if maybe DeMello's stick got a little bit on that uh, Darnell Nurse shot. I'm not sure. But it definitely fooled Hellebuck because he got a piece of it, right? It hit his glove and then, it, and, you know, just bounced over his glove. But, I mean, that's one of those goals where you would say that, you know, he had to be better and that's a, a, a stop that he should have made. But on the other hand, the only reason that game uh, was a one goal game was because <laughs> yeah. of Connor Hellebuck, right? Right. So I think, as far as I'm concerned, Hellebuck was the first star in that game, even though the Jets lost. Look, uh, Connor Hellebuck, it's a horrible goal, and we're, and we're and we're not used to seeing him give up those goals. And but he does. You're right, as to your point, he does get a bit of a pass for it. He's human, because of right? Just, like well, after all, he he is a human being. He's not a goaltending save saving robot right he never i mean you know yes yes that's correct he is a human and not a robot yes that's why you come here for that kind of analysis folks no question Mm -hmm. about it well drew by the way i don't know if anybody caught elon musk talking to andrew ross sorkin but according to him we're all going to be robots in three years that that, that was an interview with a really sane human being right there that's a guy who's firmly in touch with what's going on he's out Uh, of his mind Oh, I know he's out of his mind. I agree with you. Wow. I was like, that was a ra- that was a, you know, a lot of rational thoughts were coming out in in the course of that interview. Um, it made us look uh, like we make us some sense here, Dave. But look, Hellebuck <laughs> was the only reason it was still one nothing. You're absolutely right for the Winnipeg Jets. He was incredible uh, early in that game. Uh, you know, in that first ten minutes of the game, how many you know glorious chances did the Oilers have mm-hmm. where Hellebuck stood up uh, on? You know, I was listening to Polly Edmonds. I was in the car for a bit of it, and Polly said. You know, and I like the line. He said that, you know, Hellbuck isn't standing on his head. He's standing on his ears in keeping the Jets uh, in, in tonight's contest early on before the Jets were able to get their skating legs in the latter half of the first period. Um, look, 
it's a bad goal to give up. But the better team won tonight. Don't get confused. The Jets had opportunities. Better team if, in that game. I still think that, just for the record, I think what you're saying is the Oilers were better, better team in, in the game. game. Not, hey, not hey, overall. The, you sure the, the Jets Oilers are a better team. You sure the Oilers aren't making the playoffs uh, still there, Ginsburg? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, not not how given how, I, I how terrible think the they are. But is. I mean, winning four games in a row helps, right? Like they're going to have to win a couple more games in a row. To, for me to to really think that something's changed, but no, I don't think they're making the playoffs. Really? Because so it's interesting. With the victory tonight, the Oilers' chances of making the playoffs increased to over fifty percent, up to okay, like honestly, point. guys, we've got like three quarters of the season left. First of all, and more importantly, as Spencey would say, what is this Oilers lunch? Like, come on, well, we're not yeah. we're not here to worry about the Oilers. This is that's not what this this show is all about. Although Hamilton Dave's going to be flying into uh, Winnipeg for the Chicago game, so we'll. Uh, Wish Hamilton Dave a good good time here in Winnipeg. Miles is Hamilton right Dave now. from Hamilton Dave? That's a good question. I, I mean, I presume he is, but uh, I'm not entirely certain. I do know that there's a number of people we've been receiving messages from folks who will be at this game. So, uh, you know, good luck to Hamilton Dave. And, uh, ooh, Vicious, who says Winnipeg is going to make the playoffs? Well, we'll see. I mean, there's a fairly good chance. The odds, I suspect, if Drew wants to go to... It's 60%. 60% oh, the Jets no, no, no. make the playoffs. No, no, no. Forget the 60% thing. The Jets are making the playoffs for the simple fact of, have you looked at the other teams in the Central Division? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the, I mean the the Nashville Predators, who will never lose again, got absolutely pumped by... Well, Nashville, look, Nashville, I mean, as long as you have UC Soros and Net and Roman Yossi in the back end, and you've still got Ryan O'Reilly and Philip Forsberg, like... Nashville is always going to be a competitive team, Dave. But mm. once you go down the lines, I mean, the, the the Predators' forward depth can't compare with the Jets or the Stars or the Avalanche or the Golden Knights. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Nashville stays competitive up until the end, like they do next year. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, teams like St. Louis and and Minnesota and I mean Chicago, like like, can you name five players on the Blackhawks now that Corey Perry's been been uh, release Sent, like sent to antarctica aside from connor bedard i mean I, I know there's a lot of jason dickinson fans out there but anthony anthony bovillier now he, aren't you yeah. excited to see bovillier yeah. in action on on anthony bovillier. Funny, funny. you trade bovillier to make room for nikita zadorov and and vancouver's a good team this year but i'm just a little bit uh puzzled why they were so hot to trot uh with nikita zadorov who knows? And we can be, we can get into that more. Like you said, like Dave said uh, later on, either on this show or on Saturday's edition of the illegal curve hockey show. But I think going back to today's game, the Oilers really had the jets on their heels for a lot of the game. Now the jets did have scoring chances and you wonder, you know, will they, will Kyle Connor in particular, how many sort of, uh, scoring chances, good oh. scoring chances that he have in that second period, Dave, at least two or three that I can think of that drew. He had a lot. A, yeah, if they get a second goal, they probably they very well might win it at that point in time. He had back to back how fragile had, Edmonton is. He had back to back chances with like within like twenty seconds of, of and he shot wide and I mean he had the one timer which went wide and then he had the the shot that he took up high that was that was that he missed. And so, the breakaway. Yeah, no, I'm no, just I'm saying, posting but, this by the way because this is the longest comment I think we've ever received on the post game show. This is a full paragraph. For, in fact, it's so long, it's actually almost blocking Ezzy out of the chat. But, I mean, as you want to share it for the people who are 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 currently listening on, the podcast? listening on the podcast. Well, Kyle says that he watches every game for years now from Nova Scotia. Obviously, hi, Kyle. Thanks for watching the IC Post Game Show. Dan Robertson, Rick Ralph, many other good people. Morgan Barron, the Barron brothers from Nova Scotia. Having to stay up late till midnight up to work for 5.30 a.m. just to support the team and Kyle was not happy with tonight's effort. It was definitely not worth him staying up and being dead tired tomorrow. Where the hell was Dylan to destroy Ekholm for that nasty hit? It was Yanmark. It was on, Yanmark. Uh, JMO, sorry, yeah. Yanmark. Maybe would have fired up the rest of the team. Stupid McDavid with his cry baby, cry G to the refs. <laughs> like I said, it was a long comment. It was a long comment. It was definitely, and we appreciate Kyle's support watching us from uh, Nova Scotia into the wee hours. You know, look, let's talk about that hit because that was, I mean, I just don't understand what officials are, are, are looking at. And I know that it's a tough sport. You know, to me, it, it's so bizarre what you can review and what you can't review. Like, why can't you review that? I mean, why can't that be something that gets looked at after the fact? They review everything else. It's just, to me, it's just so arbitrary what they decide you can review and can't review because they missed the I point. see your That's point. A, so Drew, but then I think you're going to get way too many course. reviews, right? And then like, like you you're a baseball do. guy, right? Like, I, I and I don't watch baseball enough, but there are isn't that a complaint in baseball that there's too many reviews, right? 
look, I look, I don't know what needs to happen to improve NHL officiating in the Jets. Again, so we're clear, didn't lose this game because of the officials. But they just missed so many obvious things that happen on the ice in the course of a game that it makes you wonder, you know, is the game too fast for them? We talked about it. You know, they're humans. They're they're not robots, just like Connor Hellebuck is a human and not a robot. But is the game just too fast for, you know, the average official to process? Maybe Drew, are, are, are you, are you advocating? It better not be because... Are you I, advocating you, for you cyborgs? Like, I don't understand. Down. Well, no, and, 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 and I agree with Drew. Like, I, I, like maybe there that, needs to be an off-ice official who plays a more significant role in the in the course of the game, the play-by-play activities of the game. There's two referees Drew. on the ice, though, Drew, and that was obvious. That's the thing. Like, I, I, I can understand, yes, they're human beings. I'm talking about officials. They'll miss things. I, but I think when it's so egregious like that, like that was that that right. was in the middle. It wasn't in the middle of the ice, but it was in closer to the middle of the zone. It's not and it like was it obvious did. that Matthias Janmark, like Morrissey, didn't have the puck. Yeah. Morrissey didn't see Janmark coming. Like that's textbook interference. And I think mm-hmm. that's what upsets fans. Drew is mm-hmm. that when there's those obvious calls, right. that's what drives fans nuts. It's one thing if you miss an offside because it's by a hair, right? But when yeah. you yeah. miss something that's right in front of the official. And, and that was obvious. And Morrissey, that's the thing with Morrissey. Morrissey's not a guy that complains a lot, if ever. And you yeah. can tell he wanted that penalty because it was a penalty. It was a textbook interference penalty on Yanmark. Right. So if it's if it's obvious and it's in the course of the play and it's in the flow of the play, and it's not like this is a one-off mistake that they make. Mm-hmm. It's game. It's game after game after game all throughout the league. So then, yeah. you know, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> you know, watching the, the show. Well, that too, but you know, doing the same Funny thing and expecting uh, different results. So maybe there's also is being a role. on the show. Well, that too. <laughs> you know, maybe there is a role for an off ice official that can, well, that just... can take a sober second thought and, and look at the game. So to further the, the conversation with respect to this, uh, I'm just reading John Lou's tweet on Twitter said, or X, sorry, he said, uh, an official told him he and the Oilers, Yanmark, ran into each other, which further fueled Morrissey's frustration over what he felt was a blatant pick and interference while the Winnipeg defenseman was trying to defend against Connor McDavid. Well, okay, so I mean, the the so clearly the officials have a different that's interpretation. Why, for the record, for the, for Drew, let me finish. That's why one official saw it that way. Right. There's four officials on the ice. So, yeah. again, one guy getting it wrong, I don't have a problem, but that's, I mean, look, they're better... The reason why there's four officials on the ice, remember, we all grew up when there were three. Yeah. And, you know, the complaint was, oh, you know, you add another official, you're not going to miss all these calls. And nobody mm-hmm. wants to watch a game which is just like penalty after penalty after penalty. But it's no great reward. And by the way, how many holding, how many times have you seen three holding the stick penalties in one game? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that was pretty ridiculous. But again, the whole reason why, because the reality right now is the refs get in the way a lot. They really do. They interfere with the play. And, and I will give them credit. They are quite good at getting out of the way, but they do get they do ultimately play a role sometimes in the course of a hockey game where they'll interfere with some sort of flow of play. And so if you've got that happening, you're like, okay, but you you want to say that balances out by the fact that they're making the right calls more often than not. And we're sitting here watching a game and I'm like, there's four officials on the ice. How are you guys missing this stuff? I mean, right. how many times? And again, I don't care if it's a Jets call or a team that they're playing against. You want the refs to be making the right call. And you're sitting there and you're we're watching the game. Everybody in the chat is watching the game. Regardless of whether you're a partisan or not, you're watching this game and you're thinking to yourself, you're 10 feet away, you're staring at the play and you're not making a call. So again, it becomes a function of like accountability. And there is none. Like there's none. Mm. And so again, and you know, it's funny because we're talking about, you know, the refs making the right calls guys. We're, we're watching, we cover a league where they can't even have the technology in the puck to let you know if the puck crosses the line sufficiently. Right. Well, I they, mean, they it's, choose it's, not to have that technology. Well, the technology sure, exists. They let just me, choose let, not to have it. Let me just yeah, like, hasn't clarify. that technology existed in tennis for like 30 years? Well, the tennis has the Hawkeye system is what it's yeah, called, yeah. where it, it determines if the ball is on the line or not, with the exception of the French Open, because the clay courts don't allow for that technology to be used. I'm putting on my tennis hat really? here for a second. Yeah. So Why the is, it just, Open, is the clay, is it too, is it w- too wet and, and is I, it just too muddy? 
I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely certain why. What's your favorite surface to play tennis? I feel like you're a hard court guy. Well, I mean, definitely again, a clay guy. In, in, I feel like you in like Winnipeg, the grass too. In in Winnipeg, there's only there were there weren't very many options. Although the uh, like it's not the Unicity Racket Club anymore, but that's when when I grew up, the Taylor Tennis Club was the Unicity Racket Club. Uh, they do have clay courts, but as far as I know, they're they're the only place in Winnipeg that has clay courts. As we when Drew was young, they used to play like instead of tennis balls, they just had frozen manure. <laughs> <laughs> Those are called road apples, as the tragically hip out of an album about it. You might want to look into it. Um, but uh, we digress the album. On, the, on the on the illegal backhand uh, tennis show. Uh, but uh, look, all sorts, getting back to the actual on ice play tonight, the Winnipeg mm-hmm. Jets have scored three goals in their last three games. So if you really want to look for a reason why this team has lost three in a row for the first time this season in regulation is the fact that they just haven't been scoring enough. You only score one goal. You're not going to win very many hockey games. We said this at different times last year as well. Now getting Gabe Bellardi back and getting him back up to speed I think will be an important boost to this team. But you can see right now that, you know, all this talk about, well, the Jets can't mess with the lines. And we'll discuss this more on Saturday's Illegal Curve Hockey Show when we have more time to delve deeper into it. Well, I think that is is, is not something that uh, is true anymore because the team is struggling right now to score goals. I mean, you can't score against Edmonton. I'm pretty sure that well, earlier also, in the year, you you, have the to three disrupt... of us could score against Edmonton. Well, you ha- you have to disrupt at least two of the lines when a player comes back, right? If you think about it, I mean, especially, yes. uh, you know, when it's, when it's a, uh, well, I mean, we're not surprised that Gabe Velarde started off in the fourth line. It's only a matter of time before he's going to be back, uh, you know, in a, in a top six role. I think he's going to be on the second line wing. And, and obviously, you know, we'll have to talk about, they didn't score a goal uh, necessarily, but I, I think Connor Shifley Ehlers, I mean, it, it, it has to be, I mean, the, the power play goal was assisted by Shifley, but you know what I mean? They didn't score at five on five. Um, but that's a line we've been talking about for how many years now, guys, right? And, you know, they Brick Bonus used this opportunity to put them together. It's my opinion that I don't think you do that unless you're planning on sticking with that line, right? Because if you weren't, then, you know, you just bump Aya Fallow down, or maybe you bump Nemesnikov down, right, Dave? And then, you know, Velarde goes right back into the top six immediately. But as Drew mentioned on Saturday morning show, you want to ease Velarde in a little bit. I just thought that was a little bit curious that uh, with Velarde coming back, Ehlers was moved up to the top line. But I, I do think that, you know, Velarde will be back in that top six probably as early as next game against uh, Chicago. I mean, I think Ehlers was was back on the top line because he sort of gave the Jets a bit of a spark on uh, on Tuesday night against the Dallas Stars. You're looking for somebody, you know, to get Shifley and Connor going because when they were with Aya Fallow, the results were beginning to tail off. And we right, talked about that, that with Garrett Hole. I mean, if yeah. you look at five on five impact, like the go- the differential between expected goals for and dis- expected goals against. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sa- trying to sound fancy here. I guess that's why they call You're them a fancy, fancy guy, Drew. Stats. But I mean, he... those, 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 that line was not particularly good at, at five on five. And obviously, Connor Shifley Ehlers, uh, you know, it, when they have been together in, in a small sample size, they have been very good at five on five. Yeah. Look, uh, the Connor Shifley Ehlers line, you know, earlier in the game was the most dangerous line for the Jets. They were the only possession positive line for the vast majority of the game for the Jets. By the time the third period wrapped up, they were, they were, they weren't possession positive anymore, but they were still the best Jets possession line of the four that were in. Joe from Winnipeg's not buying it, Drew. Okay, that's fine. There's there's room for everybody, room for all sorts of opinions here on the illegal curve bus here. I don't Um, know if I'm fully behind it, if Joe's not behind it. The, the Jets were badly outplayed tonight. They were badly outplayed by Edmonton. I mean, you can't tell the Jets' possession numbers were 32%. I mean, that's <laughs> for, a, for a Jets team at five on five that had been playing better hockey and had been better at five on five than a lot of the teams they've been playing against. Well, I'd say the last two weeks now, getting close to the last couple weeks, maybe the last week I'll, I'll, uh, you know, only, I'll be charitable. They have not been good five on five. They have not been good possession wise. They need to find what has been had been working for them earlier when they were on that hot streak and find out, you know, how to get back to that, uh, you know, and that starts Saturday. I mean, look, you're, you're in a fortunate position that you have uh, the Chicago Blackhawks coming to town on Saturday and the Chicago Blackhawks. That'll be a win. I don't need to tell anybody the Chicago Blackhawks aren't a very good hockey team. They lost today uh, to the Detroit Red Wings handily, and there's no reason for, uh, you know, Patrick Kane revenge game, Drew. 
well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if Kane played. Kane didn't play for the for the uh, uh, Red Wings yet, as he's still, I think, a week or two away on that one. Um, but uh, look, the, the Jets should be able to take advantage of a weak Chicago Blackhawks team. But it's not like the schedule gets any easier right after that. Who who do you got coming in on Monday? Colorado. You got the Carolina, oh, no, no yeah. Carolina Hurricanes, and then you go to Colorado. Yeah. So the Jets don't have. And then a you've big got window. Colorado later back at home. Yeah, on the 16th of December, you have Colorado. So you got Colorado twice. Who do the, in the Jets play on of... February 11th through? I don't know, Ezzy. <laughs> you'll you'll have to wait. I'll have to look that it's up for you me. and let you know. But Dave, I mean, there's not a lot of time for the Jets to sort of write their write their ship right now. They have to find out, you know, get their lines back to how they want them, and find out how they're going to get back to being a possession positive team and a team that can score goals. Because three in three games is not sufficient. It doesn't matter who you're playing against. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say that was Rick Bonus uh, using an alias in the chat, but you know, obviously, Bick Ronis uh, put it there, put it very, uh, you know, succinctly, succinctly, as I just didn't. But it's three goals in three <laughs> games. I mean, that's not that's not good enough. You're not you're not winning many games like that. And and look, we it looked like one would be enough, but I mean, that was the part of the problem, right? The Jets just fire. didn't, you know, push hard enough when they had the chance to really, you know, take advantage of opportunities. And and you got to give Stuart, Stuart in her credit. I thought he was very good in net mm-hmm. for the Oilers, and he's played. I think that was his fifth straight game. So he's been the man in Edmonton uh, during this current streak that they're on. But I mean, look, I mean, yeah, you're right, Drew. I mean, at the end of the day, like you know, you even the six on five. I mean, the Jets just didn't have it, you know. Mm-hmm. And and to me, like Edmonton's got the puck in the Jets' end, and you're the team that's down by a goal, and you're trying to tie the game and what's going on here. You're, you're not, you're chasing the Oilers around. So, I mean, I thought that the jets, I don't, I don't know what it was. Like it was funny because the first two periods of that game had really good energy. And even though it was just a one, when it was a zero, zero, or then being one, nothing. And when it was a, uh, you know, for, throughout the 40 minutes, I thought it was an excellent hockey game. I really did. I thought the energy was, was good from both teams. I thought it was an exciting game. It had a mm-hmm. lot of, you know, it, it did have a, not, I'm not going to say playoff feel, but it kind well, of felt a buzz. There was a bit of a buzz, and maybe well, that's and, because and it was is the it biggest... not as simple, Dave, as what dry, dry, drywall man's comment is saying, right? Like, it just seemed like, you know, they were... Uh, first off, the Oilers were dictating the pace. We talked about it. They came mm-hmm. out on fire. The McDavid, Hyman, Nugent, Hopkins lines was, was excellent tonight. Like, I, I'm not saying that the Lowry line, when they were matched up against them, didn't do a good job. Because we were talking about it, Dave, right? Like, we both said DeMello and Morrissey always seem to bring out their best against the Oilers, right? Just go back three years... Uh, in the bubble when the Jets mm-hmm. swept the Oilers, right? But it just seemed like this game, it was too much, it was too passive, right? And mm-hmm. and yes, if the Jets scored on one of those power plays, um, you know, then they get the insurance goal and they probably win this game 2-0 or, or 2-1. But at 5-on-5, five five, to Drew's point, the numbers don't lie. I mean, the, the shifley Connor ehlers line was great tonight. But aside from that, who else was was providing a lot of offense tonight? Not Nobody, really. No, not a lot. That's the problem with the Jets right now is that the, their offense is struggling. And when you only score a goal a game, it, it, it puts a lot of pressure on Connor Hellebuck. And he kept the Jets in it for, you know, over 50 minutes of tonight's game and then let yeah. in a bit of a stinker. And that uh, ultimately pl- proved to be what did the Jets in after the Oilers uh, ended up uh, winning it uh, with the power play goal. We'll get into it all as we get going here on the post game show, the illegal curve post game show. That is it is the Betway game recap. The Betway Game Recap. Big thanks to our friends at Betway for their sponsorship of the Illegal Curve Post Game Show. Betway is the sports betting app that puts you, the customer, at the forefront. It has a large selection of betting options and sports, as well as strong promotions and fair odds. Head on over to Betway and bet your way. Please play responsibly. That important is the important part as well. So we mentioned no scoring in that first period of tonight's contest. Uh, and largely thanks to Connor Hellebuck and his and his uh, heroics. I misspoke already. The Jets did open the scoring in the first period. I got confused for a second there. It came at the 1827 mark. If it hadn't been for Connor Hellebuck up to that point, it would have the Oilers would have had a multiple goal lead, but Hellebuck was outstanding early in the game which allowed the Jets to open the scoring. Cole Perfetti, his eighth of the year, uh, assist to Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor. It comes on the power play for the Winnipeg Jets. They win a faceoff, which was rare because they did not win very many faceoffs in tonight's game. And you heard Rick Bonus talk about that 
on the in his post game comments said that the Jets' inability to win faceoffs tonight was a uh, a difference maker in his mind. But the Jets win this faceoff, and Shifley is able to feather the very nice slap pass onto Cole Perfetti's stick, and Perfetti redirects it beyond behind Stuart Skinner right from the top of the goal crease to give the Jets a one nothing lead late in the first period. As he there's not much more you can break down than what you just said, Drew, right? Like Cole Perfetti just has good positioning. It was Ekholm and, and Nurse who were back there, I believe, and, and you know, it, they're whipping the puck around pretty well. We know that the Jets' power play, you know, has been a little hot and cold as of late, more so cold, as opposed to, you know, maybe that stretch where the, the Jets were getting a point in every single game except when they played Dallas. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, this, that's just good, you know, Shifley puts a good shot on net and, you know, Perfetti's right there. Like he's right on Stuart Skinner's doorstep. Um, and, you know, Connor and Shifley were, were, I thought, you know, moving the puck really well uh, tonight on the power play. We talked about the Jets had, they have three power plays tonight or they had four, but, um, you know, they had, they had chances like the, the power play, even when they're not scoring is looking good as opposed to earlier in the season. Uh, the power play was just looking slower and they were kind of making one or two extra passes. But yeah, this this is just a nice goal. And Cole Perfetti, you know, keeps up the, you know, his his strong uh, start to the season. But yeah, that was just, uh, you know, I, uh, it was a nice power play goal. And, and you know, they needed that. At that point in the game, I agree with Drew. We talked about, you know, Zach Hyman had a scoring chance early in the game. Connor Brown had a scoring chance. Uh, Evan Bouchard had, I think, three shots in that first period. Connor McDavid had a sh- had a scoring chance in that first period. Like the Jets had a one nothing lead late in the first period when the Oilers could have easily had the two nothing lead or three nothing lead. No question about it, Dave. Face offs in tonight's game. Uh, Oilers um, just just even strength face offs, even strength. Forget about power play. Forget about penalty kill face offs. The Oilers won seventy six percent of the face offs in tonight's game, and I know that there's yeah, that's a problem. Opinion. I don't care what you say. That's a problem, Drew. Like that's you got to be at least you know above forty percent. It's got to be sixty forty. It's got to be a, you know a couple face. You know when it's. I know that there's a differing of opinions, and God help us, we all know there's differing of, of opinions on the uh, social media platforms about the importance of face-offs. But I would say that, yeah, you know, you don't necessarily want to have a guy in your lineup who the only thing he can do is is, is take face-offs. That's probably mm-hmm. too one-dimensional. But yeah. as a team, it, 76%, so three-quarters of the draws being won yeah. by one team – is too significant of a gap. If it's 60-40, well, really, what are you talking about? Over the course of, you know, 100 face-offs, you're talking about, you know, a small number that are going to be the difference one way or the other. But in tonight's game, the fact that on 76% of the face-offs, the Oilers re- regained or retained possession uh, that, uh, at even strength, that that's too much of a gap. The Jets... The players who are taking the draws, you, I mean, we know who takes the majority of the draws for the Jets. You know, uh, Adam Lowry was three of 13, th- sorry, three of 16 tonight in the face-off circle. It's got to be a source of pride for you to win face-offs and to only win three out of the 16 that you had is, is just not good enough, Dave. Well, I mean, it's but true. It was 89%, not... by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the Oilers, you know, had handed the jets a, as you said drew a, in the face off circle the jets didn't have a chance and and look you can say that it's not a big deal but when you're not starting the like every basically almost every shift with the puck that's a problem yeah. especially given an oilers team that shows how talented they are i mean let's let's be realistic connor Alabuck was excellent but the jets also got lucky right there were a number of instances where you know the puck goes off the backboard hits connor Hellebuck, and it stays wide as opposed to going into the back of the net, right? There, there were a number of, of opportunities where pucks. Didn't Evan Bouchard hit the crossbar as well? Um, well, there was he a was, post. He had six shots on goal, and he was a bit. He was in. It yeah. looked like he was in a firing range for a while I think there. Bouchard just... hit the post in the second period. I might yeah. be mistaken. Maybe the there, he got Hellebuck got a little bit with his glove, and then he he put it off the post as he. Yeah. But I mean, look at, at the end of the day, it, it, you're right, Drew. I mean, it's it's a problem. It was yeah. a problem against Edmonton, and it's a problem because. Like even let's again, I'm gonna harp on this a little bit, but at the end of the game, when you're down by a goal and you don't start with the possession of the puck, and then not only that, you're you're active, you're actively chasing it, and, and Edmonton's holding the puck in your end, right? And you're the team that's supposed to be putting pressure on six on five, and you're not doing that. So again, like it it's a problem with the faceoffs for sure. 
And I mean, I don't know what their, I don't know what the face-off numbers have looked like of late, but, and I'm not expecting you to have that, you know, right on hand, Drew, but right. Spency, you are very late, but regardless of that, we're not holding that against you, but the Jets, uh, look, the Jets are up one, nothing on a, on a nice play, a nice power play goal by the, by Winnipeg and, and credit Colbert Fetty for getting to the right spot and, and Mark Shifley for the excellent pass. And he's up to 17 assists already on the season. So, I mean, it, it the energy in the building was good. Again, like I said, biggest crowd of the season for the Jets. Still mm-hmm. not a big one. We were on press row. We were guessing. I I, I was wrong. I went over as he, it was, I guess, 14-1. So I would have uh, yodeled my way right off the hill. But it's so uh, hard to guess, right? Because especially when it's closer to the to the start of the period, right? Like you have to wait until kind of midway through the period, right, to make your guess. But even then, Dave, it's it's pretty hard to to be within like you know a hundred or two hundred fans. Yeah, no, it used I mean, to be a lot sure, easier but... when every game was a sellout. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, but look, I mean, it's it's just a it's a it was a good game, and the Jets had chances. I mean, as as folks have lift, listed here, I mean, Kyle Connor had opportunities, and uh, maybe maybe all the Kyle Connor is the greatest scorer in the history of the game now needs to like you know the, he's cooled off a little bit, of course, yeah. and hasn't scored and they, in the last four. Yeah, so I mean that's my point. So he's he's cooled off, and the team's cooled off. Not just Cal Connor. I mean, the whole team is is when when you've only had three goals in your last three games, that means a lot of guys aren't scoring goals. And so that's you know, and Connor Hellebuck, as good as he's been, I mean, how many saves did he make on the night? Thirty six. Uh, Hellebuck made thirty six. Well, thirty seven if you consider that the empty net goal, you know, shouldn't count against him. But uh, yeah, so thirty six of thirty eight is is where he was. Yeah. I was going to say the empty net goal doesn't count against him. Wasn't right. In that. So, so yeah, so 36 saves. So, I mean, look, he was, he, look, he made, he let in a bad goal, but at the end of the day, yeah, he, he was still phenomenal. I mean, it, guys, there were three Oilers shots that were pretty good within the first minute of that, of the game where mm-hmm. they, they could have taken a lead and Hellebuck was strong. And as, as he said, there were a number of other saves that Hellebuck made, throughout the course of this hockey game that, you know, showed that he, how good he is. So, I, you know, you're sitting there going, okay, Connor Hellebuck's playing that well. But you knew, like, I mean, I, I I don't know how you guys felt, but, like, watching that game and the Jets are only up one nothing when they're not burying those chances, you know that it's only a matter of time with McDavid and Dreisaitl and Hyman and Kane and exactly. Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Mm-hmm. It, it was just a matter of time before Edmonton was getting back into that hockey game. If the Jets were unable to capitalize, if the Jets make it to nothing. The way they were playing, I felt that they could have locked it down because I thought, like I said, I thought, and just to, again, not related to the goal as, but I, I after 40 minutes of play, I thought Dylan DeMello had an excellent game. And I know obviously that that first goal against is, is a tough one, but until that point really, which is 13 minutes into the third period or over 13 minutes, I thought Dylan DeMello was excellent in that hockey game. I'm Look, you, I thought he always ju- elevates his game against Edmonton. Like, it just seems like he's that, like, and the, and I, you're right, Dave, I agree with you. Like, DeMello is, he, he's just an excellent defenseman. He's mm-hmm. been good all year. He was good last year. Mm-hmm. And, like, I, I, I expect, you know, nothing less than, you know, a strong performance from him. And to Dave's point, like, when Evander Kane took that cross-checking penalty, which looked very familiar to when he used to play for the Jets and take those <laughs> stupid, I'm not, I'm offensive, not disciplined offensive well, zone penalty. Yeah, it was just like there was no need to take, there was no need to cross-check Demello there, mm-hmm. and that's what Dave's saying. Like the scores won nothing at that point. Mm-hmm. It's late in the second period, and I forget who it was. If it, didn't Iafalo have a really good chance, Dave? Um, to the left of, I seem to remember the left of Skinner. There was a shot, and then Iafalo. There was a rebound. Yeah, the puck I, like sat it, there for a it, it was a good power play for the Jets. Like they had chances. And that was the type of game the way Hellebuck was playing. If you have a two goal lead or even a three goal lead going into the second period, most likely the Oilers aren't tying that game up. So yeah, when you let a team stick around, and like Drew said, Hellebuck was perfect for the first, you know, whatever it was, 50 minutes, 51 minutes, whenever Darnell Nurse scored. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, then Gabe Velarde takes that, you know, uh, holding the stick penalty. And then all of a sudden, Dry Seidel scores its 2-1 in a game which looked like the Jets were going to hang on for a 1-0 lead. So, yeah, it's always dangerous to cling to a 1-0 lead, especially when you're playing McDavid, Dry Seidel, Nugent Hopkins, and, and, and everybody else. 
Yeah, it's, it's especially dangerous to not to possess the puck against those guys, and that's where the Jets <laughs> failed miserably into the, the course of tonight's game. Possessing the puck is important in hockey, Drew. Yes, yes, it is. It's one of those important things in hockey, especially against a talented lineup like the Oilers brings bring forth. But the Jets did have that one nothing lead uh, mm-hmm. after 20 minutes. They had that one nothing lead after 40 minutes. They will certainly rue that it wasn't more than one nothing after Kyle Connor had a number of great opportunities in that second period. And then, as we've talked about on the post game show, we say good evening to everyone who's joining us for the illegal curve post game show uh an unexpected goal with six minutes and 49 seconds to go darnell nurse his fourth of the year assist to ryan mcleod and matthias janmark it's just a bad goal given up by connor hellebuck i don't know if the puck dipped on him or if he just misplayed it they you know he was he looked reminiscent of the dave or yours truly uh misplaying a fly ball in the in the field and in, in one of our softball games just misjudged it it kicked off the heel of his glove and over his over him his arm and then into the net and you could just feel the sag that occurred at that point in time and the oilers a team always in need of a break uh got one there uh, to tie it up and then there just was a question would the Jets be able to find another gear to get back into the game or if they were just going to struggle uh, for the remainder of the minutes in tonight's contest I'm not sure what happened to Dave but hopefully we'll get him back momentarily as a just a bad goal given up by Connor Hellbuck and in, in happened there Dave I have no idea He's, I didn't do anything I literally no. didn't touch I, I, I didn't touch anything I was like in fact, I was watching the goal again, so I was not really paying attention to you guys. I was listening to Drew, but I was like, well, I assumed Drew was going to head, so I'm like, okay, if I'll just... To, if you need to take a pee break or something, Dave, I, feel I free. didn't go anywhere. I literally was like, I didn't even know. In fact, I didn't even know anything was wrong because I wasn't actually on the... I wasn't... I was watching the goal just to be, you know, clear in what I saw and get a kind of a refresh. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I, I hear Drew say, I don't know where Dave went. And I'm like, Dave didn't go anywhere. Dave's right here. Dave's well, not to, here, man. Dave's Andrew, not to your here, point. man. Yeah, exactly. Free Dave. Shout out to Garrick. Met Garrick when he used to be a bartender back in the day at uh, Confusion Corner. So shout out to Garrick. Oh, as you've been in the well. bar before? We had no idea. That's that's that's, that's, that's new. <laughs> yeah. that, that's breaking news here on the yeah. show. Well, you saw me on TV, Drew. I had a I had a beer in my hand. It only cost nineteen dollars too. <laughs> it was a bargain. Yeah. Uh, anyways, the 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 Darnell Nurse goal. It's just. You know, not Shout much to, to analyze. Zappia. They're just a bad goal. It's just a bad goal that uh, Connor Hellbuck gave up there, and the mm-hmm. Jets weren't able to lift their goalie. That's what you don't like, sort of. You know, your goalie, Connor Hellbuck, who is your all-world goalie, who do, does so much to keep you in most of your games, you want to see the team be able to respond uh, to him giving up that bad goal, and they weren't able to do so, Dave. And then Zach Hyman makes it 2-1. Uh, on the power play with the Gabe Velarde in the box for holding the stick. And you're absolutely right. I don't know when the last time there were three holding the stick penalties in, in one single game. But Zach Hyman with two oh, minutes and 13 seconds to dry go. Settle. You know what? It's really weird. I'm looking at any. You're right. It's dry settle. It, it, I think it myself said, like I, it said Hyman I'm... for some for some reason on my on my game summary the uh, sheet that the NHL on from NHL.com. But you're right. Are we breaking I... down the Darnell Nurse school still? Or are we going to the dry settle? <laughs> no, it's dry settle. I don't know the 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 internet glitch there for a second. Dry settle. You're absolutely right. Uh, assist to McDavid and Evan Bouchard and. It's a goal that it's a goal scorer's goal because it's a bad mm-hmm. angle, but it's just such an absolute blistering shot. So much so that it is our Seagram shot of the game. The Seagram shot of the game. I would give the Seagram shot of the game to Tristan Jari of the Pittsburgh Penguins for mm-hmm. scoring a goalie goal, but right. I'm not sure about the rules and regulations about us showing a goal off of somebody's Twitter feed and how that might violate YouTube uh, protocols. So instead of showing that for the uh, Seagram shot of the game. It's okay, Drew. Elon likes us. Yeah, I'll give it to, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not an Elon thing, but I'll give it to, uh, I'll give it to Leon Dreisaitl with an absolute bullet of a shot, uh, the yeah. game-winning goal in tonight's game. Yeah, and, and look, you can see that Connor Hellebuck is aware of the fact that it's Connor McDavid who has the puck and he's got to be very self-conscious of, of of his ability to score. And I mean, 97 looked dangerous. 97 looked ornery throughout the course of the evening. I think the Jets were getting under his skin quite a bit. Uh, he was reacquainting himself with Neil Pionk and a few others. He took a shot at Vlad. Poor Vlad Nemestikov uh, irritated him. He took a little bit of a headshot at running him. I think that was in the second period. No call there. But 
I mean, look, it's a beautiful pass, and Dry has got such a good shot. Like Connor like Connor Hallebuck didn't love the way he played it, but again, you know, I'm not exactly a goaltending expert, so I'm not gonna pretend like I can tell you exactly how he should have done it. It just seemed like he was he yeah. just the way he got over just left that space. And and so as a result, Dry who has an all-world shot, I mean, the guy's can score 50 goals sleeping. Uh, he puts it into the back of the net. And you felt that. Like, you know what? And again, the, you whether you like the holding the stick penalty on Velarde or not, I mean, it's the it's a tight game. And the Oilers were bringing a lot of pressure, right? They Like you said, Drew, they, they, they Jets have given up this goal late in the game. Well, with seven, just under seven minutes to go. And and the Oilers are are pushing, they're pressuring. And so the Jets are are breaking and they're not, they're not, they're not, they're they're bending significantly, and then they're breaking. And so from from that perspective, you you don't love that they went to the to the penalty kill with, like I said, with what it was 349 left in the in the third period. But you know, at the same time, there were chances. Dylan DeMello had a chance when the puck was initially um driven into the into the jet zone to clear it doesn't get it out and then again uh there's just too much space for a guy like leon dreisaitl but it's like a pick your poison you leave Connor mcdavid open to cover leon dreisaitl as and then you're leaving a guy who can score a goal on, on a dime so i mean it's a tough choice and and unfortunately for the jets they end up uh giving up one and being down to one just one more thing about that goal drew like dreisaitl was a beast in this game uh, pardon mm-hmm. me in the period i didn't think he was actually you know, that great in the first couple periods, but he starts that off, right? Like he buck brings the puck in mm-hmm. uh, and, and draws uh, attention from DeMello and Dylan. And you're right. Like McDavid is the one who eventually passes the puck over to dry but Mc- Hellebuck is completely set. If Connor McDavid shoots the puck, mm-hmm. but like you said, like it was like, he, he was just leaning a little bit. I still don't know how dry gets that puck. In. And if you, you know, I was just watching the replay, like even dry I think was surprised that he got that puck through Hellebuck yeah. just as, just because of the angle. And it's not like Hellebuck had to move, but he was, as you said, Dave, he had to respect McDavid's shot. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's, you know, just a question of he doesn't get, get over quick enough or he's kind of, you know, falling and leaning a little bit. He, he just looked like he was in a bit of an awkward, the way he moved there was a little bit awkward. And again, Hellebuck, I, I mentioned this at the top, you know, in the first 10 minutes of the show, Hellebuck, I thought, was the first star of this game. Like, he was the only reason, you know, this was a, a one nothing game late in the third period. So I, I just want to, you know, qualify that. But, you know, that's that's a, a, a shot that he, he has to stop. You want him to stop it. I think I agree with that. But at the same time, it's also such an incredible shot that only a player sure. like Leon Dreisaitl can sure. pull off. I mean, it, it, it can be both. It can be one. It can be both one that you think that he's in possession position to make the stop on or close enough that he's in position to make the stop on because he anticipated it well. But at the same time, it can also be that somehow that incredible shot uh, eludes him uh, to make it 2-1 and ultimately give the Oilers the 3-1 victory after the Jets weren't able to muster anything with the net empty. They weren't able yeah. to even get any zone time of any significance. So kudos to the Oilers, not known for being a defensive juggernaut in in really being able to shut down the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, after the Jets had some chances in that second period, the mm-hmm. chances were, I would say, very few and far between in the third period, a period that the Oilers uh, won and a game that the Oilers were desperate to win and that they did ultimately win, Dave. Well, for sure, and and again, I don't want to gloss over the the lack of urgency in that in that six on five situation because I just didn't like the way the Jets played the last couple of minutes of that game. I mean, you're down and you're trying to push, and that's a game that you should feel like, regardless of of the which team deserved to win. Mm-hmm. You know, Connor Hellebuck gave you enough in that hockey game to at least get a point. And so you, like you said, Drew, you want to see the Jets pick him up. He's played phenomenal for you throughout the course of that game. Let's in a bad goal. But ultimately, how does the team respond? Do they get that next goal to tie the, you know, to to not necessarily tie it? Because obviously at that point it was one all. But when you're down to one, do you do you have the, and, and I mean, if I'm Rick Bonus, you know, especially with the way the guys were 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 lagging a little bit, maybe use your time out there. To give your guys a little bit of a of a rest, a little chance to 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 get some get their legs back because I mean we saw it with Nikolai Ehlers. I mean I wasn't sure if he was hurt or if he just had nothing left because like with I don't know it was like 39 seconds left to go. He's just standing in the jet zone. He's not moving, 
And then he's got the puck. They're just gassed. He, he, I understand the ice for too long. So then get off the ice. Well, like, you know, again, like, no, no, because again, that's, that's the, that's the, um, arrogance or, or whatever you want to call it for not choosing, like choosing, thinking that you're good enough when you're gassed better than the guy who's got a little bit left in the tank. Did Drew call you babe? I don't think so. I hope not. I probably said Dave and it may have sounded like babe, but, uh, you know, I'm fairly certain I've never called Dave babe and I don't think I would hope not start calling you babe at this point in time either. No, you've got, you don't got me babe. So anyways, the point is that, uh, I mean, you just want to see the jets play that a little different and, and whether it's, you know, different personnel or just, again, a better result from, and, and you credit the Oilers because the Oilers were hungry and the Oilers and the Oilers are desperate. Also. I mean, look, you, you talked about it. Sure. Their, their playoff aspirations are better. And again, we went, we talked about this. I don't know if it was the last post game show. Or it was the Saturday show. The Pacific stinks. So it's not as if like, it's a, you know, like he's, what do they have to do? They have to catch Calgary. Like the, the, and again, Vegas has been in trouble and the Shea Theodore had the surgery. So he's, you know, done his week to week. So you've got uh, a, a pretty weak Pacific division. And if Connor McDavid can heat up, which he has, mm-hmm. and uh, these guys are going, I mean, I, I think Edmonton's going to be fine ultimately. But again, this isn't Oilers lunch now that Spence's in the chat and we can make that joke and he'll be here to hear it. But you just want to see... Winning four games in a row definitely helps. But like you said, Dave, like to me, going back to what Drew said about the, this three-game losing streak... What absolutely sticks out is the lack of goal scoring. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean, the Dallas Stars came in here, and the Jets had had some really good scoring chances. But mm-hmm. I think you could just really break that down to you know, Jake Ottinger was just feeling it. He was in the zone. That was a close game. The Nashville game was a close game. This was a close game. Like, And that's why I'm not too worried. Yes, they have Chicago yeah, coming up. As the, the, Oil- the Jets, look, the Oilers are not known – for their defense. And this the was Jets... the most one-sided of the three losses for sure. Yeah. I would in terms of that. in terms of possession, in yeah. terms of shots, like what were the shots? 37, 26. The possession was uh at five on five was heavily in expected goals were heavily in the Oilers' favor. But I'm just saying, like, the Jets were not badly outplayed by Dallas. They weren't badly outplayed by Nashville. I'm not I'm right. not that worried saying. that I mean, there's there's bad three game losing streaks, and then there's Good three game losing streaks, I guess, if you want to look at it like that. Like yeah, the, the Jets, Jets had... won five, they, they won five games in a row and they were 11, two and two in their previous 15 games. The Jets are still third in the central. Like, let's not right. get look, too carried the, away here. The sky isn't falling, but the Jets mustered all of 18 re- uh, shots at five on five against the Edmonton Oilers. I mean, that's not good enough. That's not, I mean, this is, they made the I Oilers agree. look, you're right. The, the, they made the Oilers look like a good defensive team. The Oilers are not a good defensive team, and the and the Oilers played well, and they get credit. But it's not like you know all of a sudden with a new head coach they they've become uh, they've become the 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 nineteen seventy Montreal the seventies Canadians well, or anything. The and thing the Jets that made is them look different that about way. this game, Drew, that w- that we haven't seen really all year, except for maybe against the LA in the the LA game or maybe in that first loss to Dallas, is that the Shifley Connor Ehlers line was really the only line that had anything going at five on five. Right. And and that's that's concerning because I think, you know, one thing to, to bring up and I'd, I'd like to get, you know, your takes and everybody in the chat as well, like Lowry, Lowry, Appleton and Niederreiter, when they're strictly playing a defensive checking role, I mean, it obviously limits their offense. And, and to me, that that line was badly outplayed by the McDavid Nugent Hopkins Hyman line. Mm-hmm. Right. So the third line wasn't doing much. The second line wasn't doing much. And obviously, you know. Morgan Barron, Gabe Velarde, you know, Axel Janssen, Fialbi. I mean, they're only going to play, like, what did they play tonight? Maybe eight minutes each or something like that. So you're not expecting much in a game like that out of the fourth line. But you're not going to win a lot of games when you only have really one line doing anything. Yeah, and the Jets didn't take any advantage. Look, Warren Fogle, Ryan McLeod, and, and Sam Gagne and his, and his two artificial hips uh, possessed <laughs> the puck 83% of the time. They had a, you know, the, the, against the... Drew, against, you're going in for your artificial hip surgery next week, aren't you? And then my hockey career will end at that point in time. So kudos to Ryan, Sam Gagne for bouncing back and still being an effective player. But the Does he have two t- artificial hips? No, he doesn't. I'm being, oh. my, I'm using, being my usual ass he has of himself. No, he doesn't have any artificial hips. He just had hip surgery. <laughs> My grandfather but, had two artificial hips. 
Okay. Did he? How was his hockey Grandpa career? Mervin did he have a Did he have a pony? <laughs> who would expect an immigrant to have a pony? Who would have? Who would yeah. expect a legal curve to still have an audience? These are all very good questions good that we don't know the answer to on uh, this edition of the Illegal Curve post game show. The Winnipeg Jets defeated uh, by the Edmonton Oilers a three one margin of victory uh, tonight on home ice uh, for the Oilers. Or sorry, the Oilers on road ice in Winnipeg. Shout out to Dan Milburn. Jets. His mom's getting a new hip. Oh, congratulations, Dan. I hope the uh, surgery goes well for your mom uh, getting a new hip. I uh, want to remind everybody about what's coming up next Thursday. That's one week from today. Celebrate the holidays with a legal curve. We're going to be live at Boston Pizza Taylor Avenue. That is on the corner of Taylor and Nathaniel. Look for the giant statue of Ezzie Ginsberg uh, nearby, and that'll be your, 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 where you need to go. We'll be at Boston Pizza Taylor. Come watch the Jets and Colorado Avalanche with us next Thursday. The game time is 8 o'clock. We're going to be there after 7.30, and then stay with us there for an Illegal Curve, a live on-location broadcast of the Illegal Curve post-game show. That's next Thursday. Celebrate the holidays with us. Celebrate the holidays with your fellow friends of Illegal Curve. We look forward to having drink specials, food specials, and prizes galore. That's going to be next Thursday at Boston Pizza on Taylor Avenue. We're going to light the candle, boys. It's the first night of Hanukkah as well. So, you know, come join us. The miracle of uh, the miracle of oil, the miracle of illegal curve, whatever other sacrilegious things I can say before somebody pulls the plug on this program. We'll be there next Thursday, December 7th, Boston Pizza, Taylor Avenue. We hope that you all will join us there as well. It's going to be a great time. When we come back on the Illegal Curve post-game show, some of the post-game comments, tough duck, hardest-hitting comment, more to come, plus whatever nonsense we come up with. It's a Thursday night. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg with you. We're live on the Illegal Curve post-game show. <laughs> Your coworkers love you because you always make them laugh. You're the life of the party with stories that have them rolling on the floor. Or maybe you're just the quiet one in the corner with the one-liners that just slay. Do you have what it takes to become Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job? Try your luck. Hit the stage at Rumors Comedy Club, and you could be walking away with $1,000 cash. Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job. Presented by Rumors. For all the details, head to RumorsComedyClub.com. So you're a pizza person. You married a wing person. But somehow your kids are salad people. You can't pick your fam, but you can pick your BP meal deal. Starting from $18.99 for takeout or delivery at bostonpizza.com. The game can change Ah! just like that. Accidents happen when you aren't protected. So now what? Getting to your injury quickly can make all the difference. Help prevent them from being game changers with Linden Market Dental Center. Bonding, crowns, bridges, and dental implants. State-of-the-art treatments are available to help you get back in the game. To learn more, visit LindenMarketDentalCenter.com. Creating smiles for life. Whoa, Ezzy. Everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving. The house is upside down. The kids failed miserably at packing the fine china. And my life is in chaos. Chaos. Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rolly's and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rolly's transfer moving and storage online at rollies.com. Boston Pizza harnessed analytics to test if the game is better at home or at Boston Pizza. The results are irrefutable. Catch the game at Boston Pizza, powered by Fanalytics. For three generations and over 80 years, Tough Duck has been making apparel that works and plays as hard as the people who wear it. From jackets to work boots and everything in between, Tough Duck's clothing can handle the harshest environments, even the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Work to live, 
live to play. Visit toughduck.com. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve Post Game Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsburg with you. It's a Thursday night. Here's what we want to remind you about Saturday morning, the Illegal Curve Hockey Show, 9 a.m. back here on our trusty YouTube channel. We've already oh. got Mikey McIntyre confirmed, Drew. There you go. Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press is set to join us at the bottom of our number one. So you can look forward to that. We'll be talking about the Jets and the Blackhawks getting you set for Saturday afternoon's matinee affair. And of course, after the Jets and the Blackhawks, we are going to have the illegal curve post game show. That'll be right around 445 p.m. somewhere in that vicinity on Saturday afternoon, talking about another battle of the Connors as the Jets welcome Bedard to town for the first time as a member of the Blackhawks. Dave M., you are giving me the finger point. What does that mean? I was going to say a, a little tease here, if you will, but hopefully okay. uh, in, a, in a few Saturdays, we haven't narrowed down ex- an exact date, but hopefully in a few days we will be, uh, that's a good, exactly, Drew, the good IC man, beer will be at uh, the Farmery retail location at 2 Donald. So you can come down on a Saturday morning. No, you we will be there. Make... The, the beer is always there, but we're and... going to be there in a few weeks time. That's is what right. You're saying. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. So hopefully we're, we're, we're angling for in a couple of weeks, one of the December shows, we'll do a Saturday morning show. You can come meet us there open at nine o'clock, which coincidentally is when the Leo curve hockey show is supposed to start. So uh, unless as you and I are late, but otherwise... and we recommend people buy icy beer and drink it at, at between nine and 11. It's not like, you know, people are like, it's a little bit early to drink. It's never too early to drink. Okay. Exactly. So <laughs> as I was going to say that the, the point is, we'll know probably by early next week when that, ex- when that show will be. And I will let you guys know, and there'll be some specials and all that thing. But uh, yeah, if you want to give it, you can, Hey, you can always drink the IC beer before that. As, as he said, to Donald street, our friends at farmery. So, uh, and we're going to have some fun stuff to come. So, uh, Stay tuned to our socials, their socials, Ezzy socials, whatever you got to do. But uh, it'll be fun. We're coming away at the IC beer to Donald Street. Farmery. Obviously, we want everyone to drink the the Farmery Light IC beer. But Naomi picked up the uh, Farmery Pink Kiss beer. Mm-hmm. It's it's similar to, I guess, kind of like the Pink Whitney. It's vodka yeah. and and pink lemonade or grapefruit juice, whatever it is. It's pink. Can it's you delicious. just can can you just promise me you never say the words pink kiss again? It's the name of the drink, okay. Farmery Pink Kiss. Something about the way you it. say it. I don't know. It's something about the way you say pink kiss doesn't do it. Doesn't Farmery do it for me. Pink. Kiss. Yeah, exactly. That's not helping matters. It's just making it a little bit worse. I'm sure it's a delicious pink drink. Kiss. Pink kiss. <laughs> Thank Anyways, you. I see we'll yes. be doing I see we'll be doing a show at the retail location, not the Grand Beat, not the um, Riding Mountain retail location. Hopefully, maybe we'll do one this summer. Yeah, but for nice. now, we'll be focused on the Winnipeg location at Two Donald. There you go. Drink, so you can look drink, forward to that. Especially, especially for those who like those types of drinks, try the Farmery Pink Kiss. I don't know if anybody we have anybody in the chat that's that's tried it, but it's very nice, very okay. delicious on ice. Mm. <laughs> pink Kiss. <laughs> Hold on, I, I think this is the best comment by Voice of Fire. I yeah. joined at a weird time. You know, yeah. vo- Voice of Fire, I'll be honest with you. Any time is a weird time here on the Illegal Kravaki show. We, we, we literally started the show with some bizarre, uh, you know, segue. So, I mean, we're, we're, whether it's the beginning, the end, the middle, it's always a weird time. Voice of Fire, don't be afraid you're in a safe show. space. You're always in a safe space when Illegal Curve and Spence are here. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up. Before we do, we'll do the Tough Duck Hardest Hitting Comment. The Top Duck Hardest Hitting Comment. What do you got for me, Ginsburg? All right, we got some really good comments here. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight on a beautiful Thursday night. Going to give it to Drywall Man. Drywall Man, I think he might have won last year, but he's always got some good comments, so I've got it up there. This team goes on a five-game winning streak, and they say, wow, we are winning too much, and then go on a three-game losing streak. Sounds like this team needs to hear from sports psychologists. I agree. Like, I I think, you know, The Jets were outplayed tonight in terms of possession and expected goals. There's no denying that. I mean, the Oilers probably should have had one or two goals in the first period. But let's not get, you know, too worried here. I still think the Jets are are playing pretty well, especially against Dallas. I mean, that was 
literally as close of a game as you could possibly have. And I think, you know, with Chicago coming in, that should be a, a an easy W. Maybe not as easy uh, as some people think, but drywall man, send me an email, Ezra at illegalcurve.com or slide into my DMs on Elon Musk's hellscape platform, ICSEG. <laughs> send me your mailing address and Tough Duck will shoot, shoot uh, send out a, they're not going to shoot out a toque to you. They're no. going to send out a toque to you. So drywall man, Always keeping it real. Always appreciate you watching the IC post game show. There you go. Congratulations to Drywall Man for his victory in tonight's Illegal Curve post. Uh, in the tough duck hardest hitting comment on the Illegal Curve post game show. Uh, something to watch: the health status of Vlad Nemesnikov. He left the game uh, in the third period after getting tangled up with Darnell Nurse. Sounds like it's a lower body issue not sure how serious it'll be but uh just when you thought the jets were maybe getting back to health uh, minus rasmus kupari of course sounds like nemesnikov will be uh keep an eye on him over the course of the next 24 48 hours and of course illegalcurve.com will have all your latest winnipeg jets news and audio uh as we approach saturday afternoon's matinee against the chicago blackhawks Want to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors for their support of the Illegal Curve post-game show. That's our friends at Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club. Ivan Decker in town at Rumors tonight, Saturday and Friday. The early shows are sold out. There's still a few tickets left for the late shows, so get them now if you want, and you do want to get them to see the hilarious Ivan Decker. Big thanks to our friends at Farmery Beer, Rolly's Transfer, Seagram's, Boston Pizza. We're going to be there next Thursday. Put that in your calendars, folks. Make sure you join us next Thursday. Tough Duck. Congrats to Drywall Man for his big win. Betway, they're the title sponsor of the post-game show. Zappia Group Realty and, of course, Dr. Les Rikus and the team at Linden Market Dental Center. Jets lose 3-1 tonight to the Edmonton Oilers. We're next in action on Saturday morning. Yes, Dave, one thing. What do you have? I think I may have some moose tickets to give away. Now, I'm not expecting to do it right now on the show, but... Okay. If you want to go to the Moose game in the IC zone, they're playing Friday and Sunday. Sunday is the RCMP game, so they'll be wearing the specialty jerseys. I'll take those tickets, Dave. Sold. But if you want to go to the, <laughs> if you want to see the Moose game, uh, hang on, hang on. I, I'm getting word from the Manitoba Moose. Uh, they've revoked the, they've revoked the tickets. Yeah, is, the is IC zone happened. is now is no more. Yeah. So I, I, I'd have to check to see. I can't. I know I did give some games away in advance. But I think I still have um, some for this weekend in the IC zone. So make sure you send me a message, Dave at AlilCurve.com. The key to Chibrikov, Brad Lambert, Dimitri Kuzman, a lot of a lot of young guys, Danny Jilkin. Who else am I missing, Ezzy? There's so many. So many prospects. Listen, Remus so had time. Danny Jilkin on Winnipeg Sports Talk a they couple did. days ago. Yeah, I, I didn't appreciate that because I wanted to do a uh, I was gonna chat with Danny Jilkin, and then I was told going on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk. I'm like, does right. Dave I, have uh, Danny Jilkin exclusivity? I don't, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he did, and he, then yeah, he found out a very rude awakening. He doesn't, in fact. I, I did not, in fact, uh, have it. Dave, so. and, Dave and Dan Fink have beef now, is, is by the sound uh, of it. No, that would be incorrect. It was not. It was our friend at Fusco Nation, Anthony Fusco. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hard to keep track. And, and nonetheless, uh, yes, if you want to go to the Moose game, send Dave a message and he'll be able to hook you up, hopefully, uh, if not for this weekend and whenever he's next got tickets for. So uh, keep it locked on Dave's Twitter feed at IC Dave. Keep it locked to Ezzy's Twitter feed at IC Ezzy G. And keep it locked to my Twitter feed if you want the latest on Kentucky University at of Elon Kentucky Musk. Sports at IC Drew. And of course, we're also on Threads and we're on Blue Sky. Yeah, we just, as hey, well. we just, we, yeah, we just, yeah, I saw that, Drew, that you, you were doing a little self promotion. What is that? Blue Sky is supposedly the platform that is going to, at some it point stinks. in time, like re replace the hellscape. No, it's but, not. Uh, well, can I finish? Stop interrupting me, Ginsburg, even though I know it's not Ginsburg doing it this time. Uh, anyways, Blue Sky is apparently this prod, this, this platform that's eventually going to allegedly replace the hellscape, but it's doing a very, very you, low rollout. Uh, and, and dragging it out, so I have a code that's so I'm illegal. Curve is on is on blue sky on blue sky. I'm on blue sky. I've never really used it. I don't really know what it's all about, but we're there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, isn't it's, there it's already sad. too many social media platforms? Like, like uh, there's already twelve of them. Like, how well, many more do we need? Seven JP Seven B is asking, what is Thread? Threads is almost like an Instagram version of Twitter. 
but yeah. we just crossed it. Hey, we just crossed the 2000 followers uh, threshold. So that's not too bad. We've been... I'm pretty sure I don't even follow us on threads. No, well, I'll never. Then you're, then you're, then you're missing out. Threads. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's hard to keep, it's hard to find the time to keep, like, keep track of all this, uh, all the, all this really important things, not the least bit of nonsense, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> that's where you can find us. If you can't find us on, Andrew, uh, how's on, your Mastodon on, account doing? My, I, yeah, I think I even had a Mastodon account <laughs> briefly. I, I, I'm not sure if I still do or not. Uh, I don't know. I give up. That's Drew, it Drew's for me. A, Drew's a build a bear when it comes to social media. Like, just throw out a social media platform and Drew will join it and then never use it. <laughs> That's basically, yeah, exactly right. It's like I have it all, but I never use it. And uh, yeah, I don't have a TikTok account. I still have never crossed that Rubicon, although I know you have there, Ginsburg. Uh, well, for Hockey Manitoba, I have a tick. I, I set up a TikTok account, but like personally, like, I, Drew, I'm, I'm 41 years old. I don't I know. I, like, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's a, a ticky talker. I not, nor should uh, I be a ticky talker at any point in time, either. Holy we, we, Donna, we, can we end the show for God's sake? Because we've really gone off the rails. Okay, goodbye, everybody. I'd say, I'd say yes, but I don't really have anything else to do. So let's keep this going. Well, we'll, we'll be do back a post, on post game show. We'll be back on Saturday morning at nine a.m. We love appreciate you, everyone joining us. If you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, leave us feedback here there and everywhere because we always appreciate what you have to say for dave manuk in the top right for ezra ginsburg in the bottom middle i'm your host drew mandel until saturday night pardon me saturday morning at 9 a.m like, uh... we wish you good night and good luck and thanks for watching the illegal curve post game show thanks for listening to this broadcast from illegal curve hockey for more great illegal curve content subscribe to the illegal curve youtube channel Follow at Illegal Curve on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit your online home for hockey in Winnipeg, IllegalCurve.com.